It is typical as we uh, begin a new year and we're just a couple of months into a new year to feel a bit optimistic. New years bring new beginnings. Uh, a new year is a clean slate. A new year uh, provides us with fresh hope. And, and 2021 uh, may be even more welcome than most years in our recent past, just due to the bitter taste that 2020 left in many people's mouths. Uh, but as we do begin new years, that often comes with new commitments, uh, fresh goals, uh, things that we set. We call them resolutions. Maybe it's spend more time with family. Uh, maybe it is to read God's Word with greater consistency. I know uh, for many of you, you had vocalized as we moved into this new year that you had set some particular goals along those lines. Uh, watch less TV, spend less time on social media, lose some weight, worry less about money, start a new hobby. There's all sorts of things that we could consider as we think about a new year. And so for those of you who began this year like I did with some of those commitments, um, I wanted to regroup and offer some biblical help because, as Dustin mentioned, we've been working through the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. So far we have covered love, joy, peace, patience, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and uh, we even added in gratitude and generosity along the way. And now today we finish out the list that Paul provides for us here in Galatians 5 with the fruit of self-control. Proverbs 25 Verse 28 says this, a man without self-control or a man who has no rule, control over his own spirit is like a city that's broken into and left without walls. It's exposed. It's open. According to Proverbs, self-control is the believer's wall of defense against the enemy's attacks, the desires that are going to wage war in our lives and against our souls. Here's how Jerry Bridges defines self-control in his book, A Fruitful Life. He says, self-control is the exercise of inner strength under the direction of sound judgment that enables us to do, to think, and to say the things that are pleasing to God. I like uh, Aaron uh, Minikoff's uh, definition, it's a little bit more practical. He says this, self-control, simply put, is the ability to look at a piece of chocolate cake and not eat it. Uh, it is uh, to accidentally click on an explicit link and immediately close the window. It's to hear a tidbit of uh, salacious gossip and to immediately end the conversation. Self-control is speaking with kindness and love when you want to scream and speak with harshness. So with that in mind, let's consider what Dustin just read for us leading into this particular text because there's a few things that I want to remind you of. There's a few principles that, that we led into this series way back in October uh, that we need to repeat as we bring this particular aspect of Galatians to a close. And so I want to remind you of these truths. First of all, as Dustin said, we are free. We are free to be fruitful. Uh, many of you will remember that this, this Galatians series that we actually started a year ago this week. It was the first weekend of March that we started that before everything began to shut down. Uh, but this series is titled, uh, Free to Move Forward. We are free in Christ. That's the point. Christ makes us free. We are free to no longer be bound by hate. We are free to no longer be bound by grumbling and complaining and depression and harshness and all of the other sins that would try to bind us. In Christ, we are free. He came and he put sin and the old man to death and gives us new life. We're free in him. We're also at war. Uh, what the context leads into explains to us that we are in a battle and the battlefield is your own heart. It's your own life that is on the line. On one side of the battlefield, you have the flesh and its desires. It has been rendered powerless by Jesus on the cross. It has been put to death, yet it still fights. And on the other side of the battlefield is the Holy Spirit that is working within you. He is the omnipotent, eternal, and sovereign God who is at work inside of us, striving to produce holiness, righteousness, Christ-likeness 
exposing and cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. And these two forces are violently opposed to each other. And so Paul encourages us to submit ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. He challenges us and encourages us. So for the past few months, we have been examining and considering each of these fruit of the Spirit. And, and my prayer throughout this for, for myself and for you is that, that this fruit would be cultivated in us weekly. And I do hope that you can look back and you can see, I am more loving than I was. I am more patient than I was. That's, that's the goal. That's what happens when we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit because Christ's virtue begins to grow and work through us. That's what we're striving to do. But if we're going to do that, there's things that have to be put off and there's things that have to be put on. In Ephesians 4, another text that we've looked at throughout this, it says, put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self that's created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so we have to realize that if I will grow in love, something has to go so that it can grow in my life. So hate needs to go. Selfishness needs to go. If I will grow in the fruit of thank thankfulness and gratitude, complaint has to be put off. If I grow in the fruit of joy and peace, my anxiety and worry must be put off. If I will grow in the fruit of patience and forbearance and being long-suffering towards other people, then impatience and self-righteousness has to go. Just last week, we talked about the fruit of gentleness and harshness has to go if we will grow the fruit of gentleness. And so... Today we are talking about cultivating the fruit of self-control. Uh, first, we have to diagnose the problem. What has to go if we will be self-controlled? But, but before we begin to look at three particular areas that we're going to focus on today, out of many areas that we could focus on, uh, this is an appropriate end to the list that Paul creates here. Uh, I want you to understand that we recognize that love is the appropriate beginning to the list of the fruit of the Spirit because all of the other virtues, all of the other fruit flow from love. And we see this is this keystone fruit. It's why in Corinthians, Paul would say love is the greatest of these. Love is absolutely necessary. But why self-control at the end? Because if we don't have self-control, we will never grow in love. If we don't have self-control, we will never grow in joy and peace and patience. All of these fruit are dependent upon this fruit of self-control to be present in our lives. And so let's talk about some areas we struggle. Number one, we struggle to control our body. The truth is God created us with bodily appetites. God created us to enjoy the pleasures that he has created. But all of those pleasures that he's created for us to enjoy are meant to be road signs that point us to him, the greatest pleasure of all. But what happens for us, sin corrupts, and so we exhaust ourselves trying to find satisfaction, joy, fulfillment, in all the wrong places. As Paul wrote in Romans 1, we worship the creation more than we worship or instead of worshiping the creator. One of those things is far greater than the other. Um, that reminds me, we were, we were doing some uh, of our catechism reading at dinner a few weeks ago, and that verse popped in my head in a conversation in Cademan at the end of the table. He's like, worship the creation more than the creator. Dad, that's pretty good. And I'm like, well, should I tell him it's from the Bible and I, not original with me? Uh, that was Paul. That was the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we, we got a good chuckle out of that. Uh, one way to describe our struggle is this. We just overindulge. We overindulge. Uh, we have a tendency to overindulge our various appetites and consequently Bridges writes, we need to restrain them. This is where it's important for us to understand that we're at war with our own sinful desires. And so what are some common ways that we overindulge? What are some common pleasures that we tend to try to find full satisfaction in? How about food? We'll start here, obviously. Gluttony is the issue. 
I'm an expert in this particular area. Uh, Gluttony is when we allow the sensual part of our God-given appetite to rage out of control and lead us into sin. We need to remember that even our eating and drinking is to be done for the glory of God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. I don't necessarily stand here as a hypocrite, uh, but I do stand here as a failure. I've been pretty open uh, with the congregation about my struggles in this particular area. Uh, I have not sufficiently worked to cultivate the fruit of self-control in this main area of my life. Um, Another common way we overindulge could be relaxation. Could be called just laziness. And the truth may be that you work hard at your job and your occupation, and and maybe you stay on top of projects at home, and you're not lazy around the house. You take time to, to spend and play with your kids and do those things. But what about your spiritual life? Maybe you're lazy in that area. In the Gospels, we read of Jesus rising early in the morning so that he could take time to pray and and spend time with the Father. Listen as Jerry Bridges offers uh, some instruction and encouragement in his own testimony. He says, there's a form of self-control that says yes to what we should do as well as which says no to what we shouldn't do. Here's his example. I seldom want to study the Bible when I first begin to study. And this is a man who's made his life out of studying the Bible. He says there are too many other things mentally much easier to do, such as reading the newspaper or a magazine or a a good Christian book. Uh, I could add in scrolling social media, watching TV, etc. A necessary expression of self-control then is to set myself down at the dining room table with the Bible and a notebook in hand, and say to myself, get with it. This may not sound very spiritual, but neither does Paul's exclamation, I beat my body, and I make it my slave. Get with it. Maybe it isn't your spiritual life. Maybe generally you are just lazy. Maybe work is a struggle. You have a pile of bills on your desk that you just can't bring yourself to go through. You've got a growing to-do list that you just can't muster the energy to start. Well, the fruit of the spirit of self-control says this, get with it. Get with it. Take control of these particular areas of your life. For some of you, we may flip this around. Some of you may overindulge in work. You need to learn to stop. You need to learn to rest. Uh, You need to learn to take better care of your physical body, to go on a walk, to to get exercise that you need, to slow down, to simplify, to to find moments of Sabbath in your life. You see how easily it is for us to fall on both sides of this area of self-control? It's the way sin works. We have to find the balance that we see of sound judgment in Scripture. One final area that we must be vigilant in our own bodies is the area of sexual immorality. And impurity. I believe everybody in this room would agree that Scripture is, is clear that any type of sexual relationship outside of the covenant of marriage is what we see God forbid in the pages of Scripture. It's a violation of God's created order. It's a violation of His law. It's a violation of His holiness. Do you remember back when we were kicking off this particular study, we looked at this verse in Ephesians Chapter 5 that says, not even a hint of sexual immorality should be named among you. Not even a smidgen of it. No foolish talking, no joking around. Friends, we have to be on guard here with great consistency. Even our thoughts and certainly what we view, what we read, what we listen to. Jesus is very clear in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount that it's not just the act of adultery. It's the thought It's the intentions of the heart. It's the desires that condemn us. We have to cultivate self-control to replace wrong thoughts with right thoughts, to replace ungodly, selfish, impure thoughts with righteous, Christ-like thoughts. Self-control to to look away, to not look back at images. Uh, As Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look lustfully at a woman. Just last uh, Sunday... 
uh, for our young adult ministries. Uh, we're going through Proverbs, and so Proverbs isn't necessarily range force in subject order, and so we're just kind of taking these snippets from different passages and talking about work and, and different attitudes. But last Sunday, we talked about this issue of sexual immorality. And in chapters 5, 6, and 7, it seems like that is the full-on subject uh, that, that this father wants to convey to his son. Beware of the dangers that exist here, because many are led away like an ox going to the slaughterhouse, or like a bird flying through the air and is hit by an arrow, and in an instant, our lives are ruined. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians that it is God's will that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn, listen to these words, to control his own body in a way that is holy, honorable, not in passionate lust, like the heathen who do not know God. We have to learn self-control over our bodies. There's a lot that could be said a lot more that could be said in this particular area of self-control. Um, if, if you struggle in these areas, anything that we've talked about, please find some accountability. Find some help in this. Come talk to me. Come find one of our deacons or somebody in the church that you trust and begin that particular conversation. The second area that we want to look at as we think about self-control is struggling with our thoughts. Having self-control over our thoughts. The scripture teaches that we are to, to take captive every, every thought and make it obedient to Christ. This means that we have to practice self-control so that we entertain in our minds the thoughts that are acceptable to God, pleasing to Him. Philippians 4.8 is a, a text that you've no doubt heard at some point, but it says this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true... Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Only think about these things. Self-control of our thoughts then is more than just refusing to admit into our minds sinful thoughts like lust and greed and envy and anger and selfish ambition. It's controlling our thoughts so that we can focus our minds on what is good, what is pleasing to God. So as we've said before, it's not enough that we don't allow anger to grow in our hearts towards a coworker. We're, we're not playing it neutral. We want love to grow in our hearts instead. It's not enough to just hold my tongue and not say the things that I want to say. I want to change the way I'm thinking. I want to change those words that would come to my mind. If I'm to avoid thinking lustfully about others, then I have to think lovingly about God lovingly about my neighbor. Those are the thoughts that should captivate our hearts and our minds. So let me offer a quick warning. Be careful what you feed your mind. Proverbs 4.23 says this. It says uh, that we have to guard our heart with all diligence and vigilance because from our heart flow the issues of life. Some of you are feeding yourselves garbage. It may come through television, through friends, it may come through people you follow on social media. You're feeding yourself garbage. You're, you're listening to others who are gossiping and slandering. And what goes in will come out. Garbage in, garbage out. Bridges writes this. He says, our minds are, are mental greenhouses uh, where unlawful thoughts, once they're planted, they are nurtured and watered before being transplanted into the real world of our actions. What we put in will come out. We have to learn to, to flee from these things. As we talked about last week, Paul encourages Timothy to flee from these things. What does it look like to, to flee from social media and from television and from gossip? It's shut it down. Shut it down before it begins to infiltrate our minds. We've got to control thoughts. Final area that we're going to talk about today. Self-control in our emotions. In our emotions. Th this connects controlling thoughts because we're, we're thinking for us leads to these actions and leads to the emotions that we feel in those moments. And so where might we struggle here? Where do we often lack self-control in our emotions? 
Well, you could just go through a litany of lists. Maybe for you it's fear and worry. You, you grow anxious. Those emotions begin to control you, or it's anger that begins to control you. We can look back at the list that, that we just read in verses 19 through 21, these, these fruit of the flesh that are present in our lives. What all these fruit of the flesh have in common are this. They're focused on self. They're focused on you. They put our disappointments, our wounded pride, our shattered dreams on the throne of our hearts. Those become the things that rule us. We nurture resentment. We grow bitter. We wallow in self-pity. We justify, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know how bad I have it. These are the thoughts that continue to roll through our brains and control our emotions. Intellectually, we know that God works all things together for our good. We know the truths and the promises of Scripture, but we struggle to separate. In defiance of those God-given promises, we choose to think about that which dishonors God and is destructive to our own spiritual health. I don't know if you felt this battle. As we've worked through the fruit of the Spirit, I've felt this battle for the last several weeks. Whatever fruit we talk about on Sunday, come Monday, it is all-out war in my life. I mentioned this to some earlier this week. We talked about gentleness last week, and I'm typically a pretty gentle person, generally, but I struggled with gentleness on Monday and on Tuesday. It was all-out war in my life to not be harsh, to not be coarse, because I was thinking wrongly. Selfishness had taken root in me. I was throwing pity parties. I was uh, not getting what I wanted. And therefore, my emotions followed suit. So how do we deal with this? Well, listen, I've always appreciated uh, these challenging words from uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's a pastor of a former generation who uh, has passed on. But he, he writes this in relation to our thoughts. He says, the main trouble in this whole matter of spiritual depression, that's the greater context, is this, that we allow ourselves to talk to us instead of talking to ourselves. Am I, am I just trying to be deliberately paradoxical? Far from it. This is the very essence of wisdom in the matter. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. Take the thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they start talking to you. They bring back the problem of yesterday. Somebody's talking. Who's talking to you? Yourself is talking to you. Now, this man's treatment, and he's referencing Psalm 42, was this, instead of allowing himself to talk to him, he starts talking to himself and he says, why are you cast down, O my soul? His soul has been repressing him and crushing him and so he stands up and says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. Do you know what I mean? If you do not, you have but little experience. You see, the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself, self-control, right? You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to your soul, why are you cast down? What business have you to be disquieted? You must turn on yourself and abrade yourself and condemn yourself, exhort yourself and say to yourself, hope in God, instead of muttering in this depressed, unhappy way. And then you must go on to remind yourself of God, who God is, what God has done, and how he has done it, and what God has pledged himself to do. And then having done that, end on this great note, defy yourself, and defy other people, and defy the devil and the whole world, and say with this man, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance, who is also the health of my countenance and my God. A huge part of self-control 
is what Martin Lloyd-Jones sums up so well for us. It's not listening to ourselves. It's preaching to ourselves. It's speaking truth into our lives. The struggles are clear. The question is, how then do we cultivate self-control? How do we control desires to eat? How do we control desires in the area of sexual lust or, or for worry or for keeping our tongues and our emotions in check? Let me give you just a few things to consider as we close. First of all, we need sound judgment. And where do we find sound judgment? In God's Word. His truth. Scripture reveals to us what is right. Scripture reveals to us what is wrong. Scripture tells us that overeating is wrong. It tells us that sexual relations apart from the covenant of marriage is wrong. Scripture tells us that worry is sin. Scripture tells us that anger is sin. It's only when we study God's Word and we examine ourselves in the mirror of God's Word that we begin to know and exercise sound judgment. And, and in all of these areas, even the ones that I've listed as examples, the world is opposed. The world has a, a completely different set of judgment than God's Word, and we see that oftentimes in stark contrast to each other. And so if we are listening to other voices and we're feeding garbage in, finding the truth of sound judgment will be very difficult. Think about it from just a statistical perspective. If you only take in the sound judgment of God's Word for one hour every week as you sit here and you allow uh, the media and entertainment uh, industry and all of those other things to feed you for countless hours throughout the rest of the week, how will your judgment fare? We must have sound judgment. Second, we must face the issue of whether we're truly willing to give up enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin in return for the greatest pleasure of all, that is Christ. In His presence is the fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. These are the promises that we find in the Scriptures. Are those promises enough? Is He enough for us? Are you willing to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life? He is Lord of my appetite. He is Lord of my desire. He is Lord of my thought. He is Lord of my emotion. Do you want Jesus more than food? Do you want Jesus more than the satisfaction of telling that person off who just cut you off in traffic? What do you want more? Who will be Lord of your life? Who will sit on that throne? Third, we have to fight the battle in our mind. We have to preach to ourselves. We have to say no to the passions as they first enter into our mind. There is a war and there's no room for error. There's no sympathy for the enemy because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that doesn't just mean you. It means the other people in your life and around your life. Puritan Thomas Watson wrote this. He said, we must spill the heart blood of every sin. It's war. It means that we can't linger, even for a moment. We often slide into sin without ever even taking out our sword and going for its throat. <laughs> we immediately rationalize and justify ourselves. We say, oh, I'm, just, I'm just looking we make excuses. I didn't, I didn't start the conversation with the person. They're the ones who started the conversation with me. We presume upon God's grace and say, oh, he's a gracious God. He'll forgive me. I'll just ask for forgiveness after the moment of pleasure. We engage in self-pity and say things. This is a good one for me. It's been a hard day. It's been a hard week. I deserve this. I deserve it. Consider Bridges' own battle with the study of the Bible at this point. He says no to himself. No, you're not going to read the newspaper. You're going to open up God's Word. And you're going to read. And you're going to study. Get with it. In Christ, friends, we are free to make that choice. Apart from Christ, we are not free to make that choice. 
It's why the cross matters so much. It's why the resurrection matters so much because in him we can choose what is right and what is good and what is true. Fourth, we need to bring our fiercest battles into the light. I have no doubt that many of you who sit out here today are weary from the fight. You've been fighting particular battles. Maybe it is you've been trying to gain control over certain emotions that have just been ruling you and burdening you and driving you. Maybe you're on your hundredth diet. And it's been exhausting. Bring those battles into the light. What I mean by that is invite somebody else in. Invite a, another brother or sister in Christ to join you in that battle and, and ask them to pray for you. Ask them to step into your life and encourage you. Ask them to be that voice that will preach to you when you struggle to preach to yourself. Because we're not meant to do this alone. We've said it before, the Christian life is not a Rambo experience. We don't just go in and take everybody out ourselves. His call sign was lone wolf for a reason. There's no lone wolves in the Christian experience. That's why the church is so vitally important for us. Invite other people into your struggle. Number five, finally we have to pray for inner strength. We must remember that it is God who works in us to will and act. Apart from Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit, producing that fruit of self-control in your life. These, again, remember, are the fruit of the Spirit. They're not the fruit of Josh. They're not the fruit of you insert your own name. This is the fruit of the Spirit, and we are absolutely dependent upon the Spirit to help us to cultivate self-control in our lives. And so we go to the cross. And we remember that on the cross, the old man was crucified. He was put to death. We were raised to new life, and now we're free to follow Jesus. We're free to cultivate love and joy and peace and patience all the way down to self-control. And we also, in that moment, we plead with the Holy Spirit to give us the strength the grace, the power to overcome the temptations that are present in our lives. And let me, let me tell you from my own experience, one prayer is not enough. Because here's what I'll often do. The temptation will present itself. We'll just use that chocolate cake thing as an illustration there. Oh, God, Spirit, give me strength. That chocolate cake's still sitting there. Well, I guess you didn't give me strength today. So I'm going to go ahead and eat that today. Give me more strength tomorrow. That's not a fight. That's a roll over and die. That's me somehow justifying in a spiritual manner getting the thing that I want. No, fighting is when we plead and we plead and we plead and we get up and the temptation's still present. And so we drop back to our knees and we plead and we plead and we plead. That's what we're called to do. Minikoff says that we have to pray forcefully. Remember that widow woman? She went back and back and back before the judge. You've got to fix this problem. You've got to fix this problem. You've got to fix this problem every day. We pray forcefully. We pray confidently. Because we know who we're praying to. We know, friends, we know that God wants to produce the fruit of self-control in our lives. It's assured. It is the fruit of Jesus. He was the most self-controlled person. And he longs to see that in us. And so we pray confidently knowing that that's the case. And then we must pray daily. Daily as we walk through these struggles. Where do you struggle with self-control? Is it body? Is it thoughts? 
Is it emotion? Is it all of the above? I want to give you a moment to pray. Give you an opportunity to make confession, to repent, to make commitment, whatever you feel necessary in this particular moment. But I'm going to ask you to bow your head and just in the quiet, take the opportunity now to let the Spirit work in you. Spirit, this week, will you do the miraculous work of helping us to gain victory over certain areas of our lives so that we can come back here next week and recognize and confess and give praise to you for a changed life. Lord, for those who are here who I know struggle with emotion, it, it drives them, it crushes them. Help them this week, God, to by sound judgment and by your spirit find freedom to think on the things that are true and lovely and pure and noble, things that bring pleasure to you. God, for those who are crushed and being crushed by the, the temptation of sexual immorality, gluttony, laziness, whatever it may be, God, it affects our, our body. Help us this week to, like Paul, see that our bodies have been beaten into subjection. Not because of things that we did, but because of your grace. Not so we can come and boast that we've lost weight or we found some victory in an area of our life, but so we can boast in you and give praise to you. Because in Christ we are free. God, I just pray that this week that would be the reality that we experience. The battles will be real. They will be fierce. But God, praise you for the battle. Praise you that you've given us the spirit to fight on our behalf, to pray when we don't even know what to pray, to protect us and preserve us, making us holy making us like Christ, all for your glory. Ah, oh, thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.